very much. Um, so welcome, everyone. And uh, I really appreciate you spending some of your Saturday here with us. I can talk about stream analytics all day long, but we won't today. We'll, uh, we'll kind of keep it to 40 minutes. And actually, what I'm going to do in this session is actually two parts. The first part is part of a session that was run at uh, San Francisco Next, where the product manager for Dataflow, Sergey, um, uh, went through some of the new features. And then for the next part, we're going to actually run through a full end-to-end -end demo that was available at the San Francisco uh, Next um, demo booths. So um, it is a bit tight on time, but we'll see how we go. OK, so um, starting with uh, stream analytics. What is stream analytics? For me, it is the continuous processing of data without having to materialize all of it first into a batch format. Now, there's three, it's a little bit of an oversimplification, but there are three broad categories of processing that I consider. The first one is transport. That is just taking a stream of data that's arriving, for example, from IoT devices to files or to your data warehouse, for example, BigQuery. The next category is where you're actually doing some enrichment of that stream. So imagine you have a point of sale system on your stores. It's sending information as you're making sales. With that, you have a product ID. And in the stream, you join that product ID with the product name and then land that denormalized value into your tables. The final piece, which is the bit that I get very passionate about, is doing in-stream analytics. So that's where you're actually doing aggregations and computations, statistical functions on the stream as it's happening and connecting that to the different parts of the business. So with those three categories in mind, what we're going to do is first go through the options that you have to build out a typical streaming pipeline uh, within GCP. Um, first of all, let's think about the data points. So we mentioned IoT devices already. And by that, imagine a factory that's full of sensors and every machine is sending information continuously about its state. Um, the other one that is very common is clickstream. And by clickstream, we mean the events that are happening. One example, users are on the application in a mobile and they are clicking through various things like add to cart, etc. All of these are events that are clickstream that's being sent. And of course, the same will be true for web applications. So if you imagine this continuous stream of data flowing through, the first thing we need to do is absorb this data in some way. And some of the common tools, so Apache Kafka would be a choice, as well as Google Cloud PubSub, which is a fully managed publish and subscribe API. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. Once you've absorbed this data, you then need to do some of the processing. So the three categories I, I described. Um, now to do that, the way that we're going to describe through it today, we're going to actually use Apache Beam as the programming model to describe the pipeline, describe the transformations that we want to do on that stream. And then we're going to make use of Dataflow as the execution engine for the pipeline we designed. We can make other choices as well. We could use Apache Flink or Spark as well uh, to run that programming uh, model. And we'll go through that in more detail as well. Downstream of this, we now need to absorb the data. Um, quite often, this will be into a data warehouse like BigQuery. Depending on some use cases, you may actually want to split deliver what, you, uh, what the results. In other words, you may want to put it into your data warehouse, but you may also want to put it into something like Cloud Bigtable. One example, for example, would be time series, where we want the time series to go to BigQuery, but there are use cases where we want that time series data to be available in a key value store. Beyond that, obviously, there's then the uh, visualization and the analysis you can do with that data. OK, so let's go through some of these components. I'll, I'll pick the uh, Google Cloud Platform ones here. So we have um, uh, uh, Google Cloud uh, uh, PubSub. This is a global publish and subscribe API. It is serverless. In other words, all I need to do to set one up is to create a topic within the console. I don't need to do anything else. At that point, you can start sending messages into it. It will auto scale. It will do all of the things that you, it needs to to deal with the load coming in from day one. So whether it's 100 messages a second you need to send to it, or hundreds of thousands of messages a second. It can also act as a shock absorber for our system, because it will keep data for up to seven days. In other words, if there's any issues downstream in the processing, this absorbed data will stay on PubSub for up to seven days for us to be able to pick up later. Um, the final piece to think about with PubSub, which I think is interesting, is we use PubSub often as the ingestion, the first layer for this stream of data that's coming. But you can also use PubSub as a glue between your data analysis systems and other 
departments and different businesses, uh, different parts of your business. So, for example, you can send alerts and stuff and use data, uh, PubSub as a way of sending those messages to those other systems. And we'll actually go through that a little bit in the demo. So, in terms of Apache Beam and Dataflow, I'm going to talk, talk about Apache Beam first. So, Apache Beam, uh, open source project, uh, the, about three years ago, Dataflow SDK was donated to Apache Foundation to begin that uh, project. Since then, we've had a really vibrant community. In 2018, I believe it was in the top three of a uh, number of commits for an Apache project. It was also the, one of the most active for the, uh, in the dev, dev lists. And actually, if you like technical uh, content, there's some really uh, senior Google engineers who, who work on this. And they do a lot of really good technical, interesting discussions on the dev list. So if you have a cup of coffee on a Saturday morning to spare, it's worth reading through those. Um, in terms of what Beam does, it is a programming model that allows us to describe the pipeline. It works for both Beam, and, uh, for both batch and stream. So it has specific primitives that allows us to deal with some of the complexity when you want accurate below latency results from stream data. And it comes with multiple runners and language. So I'm going to go through that in a little bit more detail. This is one of the things folks like about Beam is um, the vision is to eventually have uh, many languages that, can be, that the users can use. So Java and Python support at the moment. There are more languages coming. We want the, ultimately for users to be able to pick the language of their choice and be able to design and build their pipelines. And then the other part is around the choice for the execution engine. So once you've built your pipeline, you can choose, for example, Apache Flink to be able to run and execute the uh, processing, or Google Cloud Dataflow, um, and also the uh, Apache Spark. The one we're going to talk about more today is Google Cloud Dataflow. So Dataflow is a runner where you can um, run the uh, Beam uh, uh, pipeline onto. It's serverless and fully managed. Um, it has exactly one semantics, which is very important when you want accurate stream processing. And um, it actually deals with all of the things like Windows uh, state storage, shuffling um, for you. As a developer, there's a lot of stuff that it does for me that I don't need to care about anymore. So the reason I like it is I just write my Beam pipeline code. I will design the pipeline and then submit the job. At that point, I don't need to do anything else. I just wait for my results to show up. Underneath the covers, it's actually doing a lot of things. And just to give you a sort of 30,000 foot view of what it does, I'll just walk through what are the things that happen once I submit my job. So I type my code, I build my pipeline, I press P run, I go, it submits the job. At that point, it will schedule the work, it will spin up workers, it will then deploy my code to all of those workers, it will also deploy the code that it needs to be able to do things like shuffle and windowed state to those workers. It will auto scale those workers to the right level, so it will increase them and decrease them based on the load that's coming in. It will take the inputs that I have, for example, if I've given it several streams and a database to, to read from, it will shard that data, move it to all of the workers. If the worker fails, it will move the work off that worker and put it to another worker. If there is too much work on a single worker, it can actually m migrate some of the work to other areas. All of these things are happening, including niceties like when I've written uh, log.info, log.error errors, um, messages in my pipeline, it will push all of that to a central location from all workers. And then that location is uh, uh, for us um, uh, Stackdriver. So I can actually go to Stackdriver and actually see all of the logs of the, uh, uh, what's happening on my pipeline. And all of that's being taken care of. All I did is set p.run execute. And I don't need to care about any of the stuff that's happening underneath the covers for me. And one, when it first came out, um, uh, it did have a very steep learning curve, and we've been continuously trying to improve that. Um, obviously, that kind of job is never done. It's always, there's always something else you can do to make it easier. Some of the things that I think are, are we appreciate, that folks have appreciated has been around um, uh, a couple of items. One is the creation of a job UI, and the other one is SQL, which uh, Jan's mentioned at the start. In terms of the uh, job UI, so if you recall the three categories that I mentioned of processing. One of them is transport, where you're just taking a stream or some content and moving it somewhere else. You're not doing any transformations. You're not doing any enrichment or calculation. Now, to have to write code to do that is kind of boring, right? It's uh, tedious. 
work. Um, and that's why we have uh, some uh, templates that allow you without code to actually be able to submit a job just by going to a form and filling out the details. Um, this, there's some very common templates for common things that people want to move. For example, pub sub to BigQuery, and we'll show a quick demo of this in a moment. So that makes life easier. Secondly, one of the languages that is uh, now supported in Beam is SQL, obviously a very uh, well-used and well-liked language. Um, and it does things like, so I'm a, a Java uh, person, and if I needed to do a join in Beam, I need to write all that out, um, which is pretty painful. Uh, if you were doing it in Scala, it's a little bit less. And, well, that's what we like to write, right? It's a simple join. We just want three lines of code. So let's keep it at that. Um, and so with SQL support, uh, we have the ability to write SQL within the pipeline. And one of the things that was announced, it's currently alpha, is the ability to write this SQL in um, the BigQuery user interface itself. And then rather than choosing uh, BigQuery, you can change to Dataflow, and it will submit the job for you. And actually, can I have a show of hands? Who used BigQuery here before? OK, a few folks. So BigQuery is Google's petabyte scale data warehouse in the cloud. Um, and actually, I'm going to uh, go through a quick demo of that. So what we're going to do is we have uh, sales information coming from a point of sale system. It is going to a pub sub topic. And what I want to do is do the second type of uh, work, which is enrich that stream. What I want to do is I want to take that information so that I can have the store city and location added to that piece of data for uh, downstream processing. Um, so to do that, let's go over to One of the things uh, we can see here is in this center pane is where I actually normally would type my SQL. And I would type my SQL, and in, if I was to hit run, um, I would be using one of the data sets that's available in BigQuery. Now, what I'm going to do is switch this to make use of Dataflow instead. To do that, I'm going to go to More, Query Settings, and switch the query engine from BigQuery to Google uh, Cloud Dataflow. This will make some subtle changes to the UI. Now, I'm sure you don't want to watch me type a lot of SQL. So I'm going to cut and paste the SQL I prepared earlier. So what we have different now with this UI is if I go to Add Data, in the previous BigQuery format, you would only see the data sets that are available to your BigQuery. Here, we actually have a new one, which is Cloud Dataflow Sources. And in the alpha, that is uh, going to be PubSub. So now we have a stream as a source, and I could do a search, but I've actually set this up for us already. We can also see there's now Cloud Dataflow sources available within the UI. And if I look at sales per store, we can see there is a schema attached. So in that topic, I'm sending JSON messages, and I have defined the JSON schema in a YAML file and uploaded it to the system and said, this is what the JSON looks like. Now the system knows what it's going to get when it looks at that stream, and it's going to be able to use it within the SQL statement, including validating my SQL statement. So here, the SQL statement is making use of pub sub topic and joining that with BigQuery table. And um, the, the SQL statement is valid. I'm going to create Cloud Dataflow job. Now I'm just going to hit next on this. It allows me to say where I want the um, job to uh, the table that is the output of this to be sent to. So let's just call it demo, demo set and leave it at this. Now this will actually take a little while. It takes like three, four minutes in alpha to actually get there. Um, to save us time, I actually started one this morning. This is the Dataflow uh, front page UI, which shows all of my jobs. Um, the gray one is the one I just submitted, so that's queued up. That's going to take a few minutes to get started. I started one yesterday, which is uh, this DF SQL inventory. So that's the monitoring interface for Dataflow. We can actually see the Dataflow job in the middle and some stats and metadata on the side. It's, it looks simple, but actually, if I click on this expand, we're actually seeing what was interpreted from the SQL to the Dataflow pipeline. So what it's done, it's translated that SQL statement that I had 
into a pipeline DAG, a direct acyclic graph, and this is that interpretation of what it's doing under the cover. So here, we can actually see it's reading from PubSub, and further on down, before the join, we can actually see the read from BigQuery. So that has allowed me to build a pipeline against a stream and a table in BigQuery, all without coming out of a user interface that allows me to write SQL. Okay, so let's now move back to our slides. The next part is general availability of uh, data flow, the streaming or scaling. So I described earlier all of the steps that happen underneath the covers for me when data flow does my work when I submit a job. It spins up those workers, it puts my user code in, it puts the data flow code in for things like shuffling and things like the window uh, state. Now the new service, by the way, which is optional, you do not have to use this service, takes the, uh, a, a large chunk of the stuff that's, being, that's related to the data flow service away from the workers, leaving just my user code to be run in those workers, and takes them into the streaming engine. So here, there's some very direct benefits to a user who wants to make use of this. First of all, we have a much better idea in terms of utilization because it's now just mostly user code in those workers. So our auto-scaling becomes much smoother. And there's a blog on the site um, around this which has some graphs that, that show some of that effect. Um, it's better supportability. So before, uh, you needed to run an update uh, on your uh, Dataflow pipeline to get new features around these parts, the shuffling and, the, and the, the streaming. Now, because it's all in the service here, this is transparent to your pipeline. So we don't, you don't need to update it yourselves for us to get that benefit. And finally, there's less usage on the, there's less resource usage on the workers. So we're getting much more out of those CPUs. Now this service does, um, it is optional and there is a cost associated with it per gigabyte. Um, it's currently available in four regions. Okay, so um, now uh, I'm gonna move over to an end-to-end -end demo. So I think if we're in a restaurant, this would be the point where they give us some glass of water to refresh our pellets um, and we go straight into demo mode. Okay, um, for this demo, we are going to use a retail company as our um, sort of demo environment. And let's imagine we have some st uh, a retail company with many stores and the VP of sales has asked us to improve the sales process specifically around couponing. So um, today uh, her results of sales from stores comes at the end of the day or the next day because everything is batch processed. She wants real-time data so that she can make couponing decisions based on things that are actually happening. For example, a store has got too much inventory of fresh produce and it's gonna start um, uh, deteriorating and we need to get rid of it. So that would be one option or um, uh, making sure people come to uh, special events at the stores, things like that. The other part is around the targeted couponing. Now, if I have, I'm gonna go through the real-time one. If we have time, we'll do the targeted couponing as well. That touches on some of the ML pieces. The general pipeline that we will use to do this, um, so the point of sale system, this is the you know, uh, scanning of the devices, what's in the basket. That uh, from the stores is going to be sent to Cloud PubSub to absorb the uh, data stream. Then we're going to do the processing. Now we're gonna do three things with every element that we have. The first thing that we do is we're going to send it every minute to Google Cloud Storage uh, for our data lake as just Avro files. So this is kind of like raw, untouched, untransformed data. We're just gonna keep a copy there. The second thing we're gonna do is we are going to, without windowing, stream it directly into BigQuery. So there we're gonna use BigQuery's ability to absorb streamed data um, and uh, update tables fresh for our sales VP. The final piece is where we're getting into that third category of stream processing where we're gonna do some basic analysis on the stream. Um, so we're gonna count the number of sales of the produce for a store and send it back to PubSub. And the reason we're doing that is then PubSub becomes a way of connecting our data pipeline to the other parts of the business. For example, the inventory department. And so the inventory department knows up to the minute or up to the, uh, uh, up to the uh, almost real time what is happening in the stores and can start scheduling deliveries and stuff as the need arises. Okay, so going on to the demo itself. Now, as we mentioned, PubSub is a fully serverless API. 
Um, so to show you the creation of one, it would be a few clicks, not that interesting. What I'm going to show you is uh, some of the monitoring statistics from uh, a uh, using Stackdriver. And on the top left here, we have um, the stats from my orders topic. And here we are seeing uh, around 200 orders per second coming into the system. Now, obviously, our stores are super successful because if you, can, if you do the maths, 200 a second of sales is something like 10 million a day. So these are really, really big stores. But we've, I've jumped the numbers up to make it more interesting. Um, so there's 200 orders, and every order will have multiple lines. So every sale will have a basket of, say, 10 items or 6 items. So there's actually quite a decent volume of data. What's really interesting is the graph on the right. Now, this graph shows how long every message is actually staying in PubSub before it's being processed. And we can actually see the median is average is one second. So all of those messages that are coming in, they're taking about a second before we're pulling them off with data flow. Now, data flow, there's some graphs here underneath around data flow's uh, performance metrics. Rather than talk through those, I'm actually going to go and show you data flow again. So here we have the monitoring user interface. This uh, uh, area, this uh, is the description of the pipeline. So I've written this in code, and it has uh, interpreted that into these series of transforms. Um, as you'll notice, it is a DAG, so there's no cycles in, uh, allowed. But here, everything is flowing downwards, and we have those three activities that we were talking about. So the first one on uh, the far left is the writing to Avro. So we do a one-minute window, and then we push the files to Avro. So this is the raw, untouched data. In the middle path, there is no windowing. There is no batching. There's no uh, 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 none of those pieces. We actually just stream it directly into BigQuery. And that's going in at a couple of hundred a second. Uh, obviously, BigQuery and Dataflow can cope with much, much higher numbers uh, into the hundred thousands. Um, and uh, on the right-hand side, we're doing stream analytics. Here we are doing a filter on fresh produce. If I click on that, we can actually see since this started, uh, there was 12 million orders processed by this line. And what I'm doing in that piece of code is I'm taking the order, I'm expanding it to all of the lines that it has, so all of the items in the basket. It's now a, a bigger piece. And then I'm filtering all elements that aren't fresh produce. So there's a massive reduction. Um, so we're going from 12 million to 4 million. That's actually much higher if you think that 12 million isn't multiplied by the number of lines. So if there was 10 line items per order, that's um, 120 million that we reduced to 4 million. We then do a 10 minute window and we start counting. The reason we have to do a window is you, in order to do a count and average, you need to stop at some point. And we need to tell the system when to stop. What's important is I'm using event time rather than processing time for this. So it's not based off the wall clock time of 10 minutes. It's based off the events 10 minute time, which is um, a little bit, uh, uh, it would take us too long to cover that in detail for this session. Next, I actually output this data back into PubSub. So here, we could imagine that down here somewhere, there is our inventory department who is actually picking up this information and able to keep inventory fresh at our stores. Okay, now let's look at the BigQuery path. Now I'm back into BigQuery, and I'm going to be using BigQuery uh, standard without the, the Dataflow um, uh, engine. Here, um, where, uh, the, I'm going to be looking at a specific table, which happens to be the order with lines table. So this table is the table that that Dataflow is pushing information into. The schema for that table is the order, and there is a repeated field. This repeated field is the order lines. In other words, it's a, a, a collection uh, that we have uh, set up. If I look at the details for the table, it's not particularly huge. It's got uh, 340 gig worth of data, and there's around half a billion rows of information. It is partitioned, and more interestingly, at the bottom, we can actually see that the streaming buffer is active. In other words, this table is now getting constant updates to it from that streaming pipeline. I'm going to run a query here. And the query is going to uh, do some enrichment of the data. Um, and more importantly, I have put in where the time is uh, less than 10 minutes ago. Let's run that query. Now, 
BigQuery uses a columnar I.O. storage structure, which means if my select statement doesn't choose all of the columns, it's not going to have to process all of the columns. It will prune those off. Also, because I had that time constraint, and it's a partition table, the system automatically ignores partitions that aren't uh, required. In other words, all the other partitions uh, that were in the schema. So instead of having to process all 300 gigs, it only had to process 70 meg. And here, we can actually see, I put in this column for convenience, the current time, 3.46.06. And we can see that the West Palm Beach, which is one of the highest in number of sales in the last 10 minutes, um, had some updates there about three seconds ago. Uh, the other one, which is, uh, I won't even, I, I pronounce things badly. So let's say Houston uh, is four uh, at 04. So this table has got fresh real-time data for all of the analysis. And I haven't had to set up a single system. I haven't have installed anything. I've just written code for that entire pipeline. Okay, now, let's, now that we have that data, we've solved the real time problem. How are we doing for time? Does, uh, we okay? Okay, so I'll do the, the couponing piece. Um, okay, so now I'm using Data Studio. And with Data Studio, we're actually able to visualize some of the information that's in BigQuery. Uh, I did open this page up just before um, the talk, so the numbers at the top are going to be slightly off. But uh, here we have you know, a visualization of the sales in the last 10 minutes from our stores. <coughs> we had the facilities data, so this ties it into the city. So we now have zip code and therefore lat long locations. We have loyalty cards, so as you go to the supermarket and buy things, if you use your loyalty card, that ties that sale to you as a user and it's your ID. So we have loyalty card information for those um, sales that they, they did provide that card. And using GIS functionality in BigQuery, we have another table that actually gives us the, the loyalty program total lifetime sales um, for me as a user to stores within 20 kilometers of me. And that functionality is basically distance and that long. We can use GIS functions in BigQuery to compute that. Okay, so we've got lots of interesting data. We have some data on our stores and stuff, and we have the live fresh data. Um, this is useful as one of the data points to start building more interesting couponing. Next, let's see what should we use as the item that we do couponing against. Um, so in our stores, globally across all sales um, forever, which was half a billion uh, rows of information. Uh, the top 20 items that are in a basket tend to be um, fresh goods, not surprising. And in the US, actually, it tends to be bananas, uh, organic bananas, etc. that they will purchase. So that's a very common purchase when people are going uh, to the grocery store. Um, in this one, we've got some geographic stuff and, and under the New York state. But um, essentially, this is an item now that we know that most people want in the store. And so it's useful that earlier on in that data flow, we were checking for fresh produce so that we know we've always got goods like bananas available. As that's one of the common things people will come to our stores to buy. And maybe this is something that we can use in our couponing to bring people to the store. So one way we could do that is we could start exploring the data with SQL. And I'm not a data scientist. Uh, so um, let's start with, with basic SQL. Let's have a look at the number of, um, for a specific user in our loyalty program, what time of day they will generally make purchases. So if I uh, run the query, actually, it's all, uh, I ran it before anyway, but let's run it again. Um, what we see here is a customer ID, and these tuples of afternoon F, afternoon T, F for false, T for true, essentially, this user has bought um, uh, uh, that produce, that uh, uh, you know, bananas, etc., in the um, uh, in, in afternoon once, um, not in this afternoon. So all of this data together gives me some idea of when that user will buy something within a day. But what if I then want to add the frequency, the location, the weather, the all of these other factors? You can keep writing more and more complex SQL to try and do this, or um, as one of our uh, folks in the, de yeah, one of my data scientist colleagues did, he just used a linear, um, uh, sorry, logistic regression to actually solve the problem. Now, with BigQuery, because it supports ML within BigQuery itself, we don't have to export the data to another system, run tests, do notebooks, etc. Within BigQuery itself, we can run the ML that we need. So here, 
uh, we have um, the ability to write in SQL with these extensions, create or replace model, a logistic regression model. And the other thing that we're doing is we're doing the feature extraction using SQL. Again, very easy language for a lot of people to use, so therefore it makes it quite uh, very accessible. Um, this will go off and build a model. I'm not going to run that now because it will take a, a, a few minutes. And essentially at the bottom, we will end up with a model on the left-hand side here, this will buy banana uh, model. And if we look at the details, we can actually see the number of iterations that that process ran and some results. So the, the training, uh, and this is also available in BigQuery, you can actually see some of the graphs of the, the trainings. And also when you're evaluating um, the model itself, um, we can you know, tweak the score threshold. I'm, again, I'm not a data scientist, so I'm not going to attempt to explain all of these pieces. Um, but essentially, we have our confusion matrix uh, of when it got it right in terms of guessing uh, where, um, uh, uh, whether that particular user is likely to buy uh, that particular produce. Finally, we have bringing it all together. So uh, we can run a query against that table to give us a prediction of folks who are likely to buy that produce. Um, in this case, we're going to use some bounds of um, uh, smaller than 60% and bigger than 50%. The reason smaller than 60%, if they're most likely going to buy it anyway, then why send them the coupon? And bigger than 50% is if there is a cost associated with sending the coupons, they want to make it for the, the, uh, the right target audience. But that's entirely a business decision. I can run that and get some results, but then you can imagine I can now run this with the real-time fresh data, and I can actually start making couponing decisions within a day, including tying it back to what inventory we have at different stores. So all of this we were uh, able to do because we were doing everything in stream pipelines. Um, going back now, and uh, so um, thank you very much. And again, appreciate you guys coming on a Saturday to spend some time with us. Thank you.